Welcome back to our devotional series, The Great Bible Truths. Uh, today we're going to be looking at the topic of the care of the church, day 143. And our passages are James chapter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 3, and 1 Peter 5. So let's look at James 2, 1 through 19. Favoritism forbidden. My brothers, don't hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ of glory with partiality. For if a man with a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your synagogue, and a poor man in filthy clothing also comes in, and you pay special attention to him who wears the fine clothing and say, sit here in a good place and tell the poor man, stand there or sit by my footstool. Haven't you shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So James starts out there and, and it, interestingly enough, uh, some translations will say if a person comes in your assembly, uh, it says in this translation, synagogue. And this is because the early Christians were largely Jewish believers. Uh, it was not until later till Paul starts to take the gospel to the Gentiles that we see it spread outside of uh, Jerusalem and Judea and these local areas. Now, that was always God's plan to take the gospel to the world. But we have to remember, initially, these Christians are basically Jews who are still going to the synagogue. They just see Jesus as their Messiah. And it's not until later, this is where the persecution from the Romans begin, is the Jews had a kind of religious exemption from having to worship the emperor and perform any type of uh, Roman rituals because the Jews were so diehard monotheistic that they were willing to fight and revolt if they, um, as a nation, if they were forced into the, any type of pagan ritual. So the Jews had a religious exemption from the Romans. But once the Christians are thrown out of the synagogues or said seen no longer as being Jewish because they deny the, the, nece the necessity of the sacrificial system and that Christ is the Messiah, which the Jews reject, now they begin to be persecuted not only by the Jews, but then they lose that religious exemption from the Romans. So this, that's just a little historic tidbit that, to keep in mind. Um, but I want us to, to recognize here that this, these communities are very already well formed because they're living together here in the Jewish communities. And I think partly what James is, is why he's saying this um, is twofold. One, because it's important and they need to grasp it to have true Christian truth. Um, but in the background is also, you know, there being a light to the other Jews who are kind of watching, like, is Jesus truly the Messiah? Let's see how these people act. And, and so there needs to be uh, a truth to their gospel, a truth to their message, not just believing an intellectual assent that Jesus is the Messiah, but that they see that gospel of the kingdom carried forth in their life. So he's saying we can't show partiality. That is against the gospel message. This is, might be how it was done in the past, that the wealthy and the rich come in and you give them place of honor, but Christ forbids that. Verse five, listen, my beloved brothers, didn't God choose those who are poor in this world to be rich in faith? and heirs to the kingdom which he promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor man. Don't the rich oppress you and personally drag you before the courts? Don't they blaspheme the honorable name by which you are called? So here we already start to see some tension uh, in the Jewish community. He, he's not going into the historical situation, it's, but we, we catch glimpses of what's going on. That if someone is to sue you, right, it's probably not a poor guy who's suing you. He doesn't have any money to sue you. Uh, it's probably the wealthy. So these, these, probably some of these Jews that are disliking the fact that the Christians are trying to hold on to their Judaism and claim Jesus is the Messiah. So he's like, are, aren't these guys the ones persecuting? Why are you giving them favoritism? It's, um, it, it's really the lowly man that God has called. It's not these rich religious leaders that are the ones that uh, you should be giving prominence to. It's those who have ultimately faith in Christ. So don't show partiality by the outward. And uh, he, he, we see here that they're blaspheming the name of Christ most likely by the name which you are called, right? They're believers in Christ. So these wealthy Jews uh, are, are uh, disowning Christ or blaspheming the name of Christ. They don't accept him as Lord. Verse eight, however, if you fulfill the royal law, According to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin, being convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point has become guilty of all. For he who said do not commit adultery has also said do not commit murder. 
Now, if you do not commit adultery, but murder, you have become, become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as men who are being judged by a law of freedom. For judgment is without mercy to him who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So his, his overall point here is, is we can't get part of the gospel right. We have to get the whole gospel right. Because just as one person stumbles, uh, if, if somebody says, hey, I haven't committed adultery, but they committed murder, then they've broken God's law. They're a lawbreaker. They're under the judgment of the law. So he, he, he looks at the law here as a law of freedom. So the law frees you. We always think the law restricts us, right? The law restricts our behavior. No, but the law frees you to live the life that God intended you. He created you. He knows how you're to live. So when you're in hatred and murder and when you're in lust and adultery and when you're in covetousness and uh, theft and lying, it's a horrible place to be spiritually. Your conscience is tormented. Your life, that, that, it's not a way to live. And that's how most of the world lives. And they're like, oh, I don't want to be restricted by God, but they don't have true freedom. July 4th is coming up here. People are going to talk about independence and, and freedom. And they're not independent. They're not free. They're slaves to sin in the true sense. And we got to see that only through Christ can we get this true freedom that people so want. <clears throat> Verse 14 now, and let me, before I even say that, mercy triumphs over judgment. His point here is, uh, in a certain sense, we're all law, lawbreakers. And so, and, and we all deserve judgment. And this is why God has been merciful to us and we need to show mercy to others. Verse 14, what good is it, my brothers, if a man says he has faith but has no works? Can faith save him? Or can such faith save him? Could this type of faith, which produces no works, save somebody? And if a brother or sister is naked and in lack of daily food, and one of you tells them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, and yet you didn't give them the things their body needs, what good is it? So you might say, hey man, I, had a, I love that brother, man. Sorry, bro, you lost your job. Sorry, you got no money to eat, man be warm and well fed you know god bless you right he's saying what good does that do if you if you have the ability to help him and and you just wish him luck right what what good does that do even so if it is if it has no works it is dead itself yes a man will say you have faith and i have works show me your faith without works and i will by my works will show you my faith you believe that god is one you do well the demons also believe and shudder. So James' point here is just intellectually believing in a God does you no good. The demons believe and shudder. So if one is, to, if one's faith is to be genuine, is to be truly uh, justified before God. So we talk about justification by faith alone. I just preached on that this last week. But justification, when we're justified, it'll faith will produces salvation. True faith produces salvation, and true salvation produces good works that's part of sanctification so we're not saint we're not saved by being sanctified or we're not saved by works but true salvation will always equal the fruit of works because the fruit of the holy spirit brings that about in our life so if people are kind of saying you have faith or i have works or i have this proper belief and that's all i need proper belief is all that's needed to be justified but it you are truly justified before God, meaning your heart's been changed. You've changed from now the flesh to the spirit. It's going to show in, in the evidence of how you treat and love your Christian brothers and sisters. If you have the ability to help and give, you'll do so. And this is why all the Christians came together. They gave to the church. They laid their stuff at the apostles' feet and the apostles distributed in need. And a lot of times, I think what James is dealing with is people saying, you know what, I, I can't give. You know, I, 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 that's not my gift. My gift is this, right? But then there's people in need and there's and, and, and the church isn't helping with their need. And, and, and James is kind of saying, well, what kind of true faith is that? You, if, if you have true faith, you're like you're claiming, you'll trust that God will provide for you, right? And so, and a lot of these times, just like most times, there's excuses as to why we can't give, as to why we can't help, as to why good works aren't part of our life. And James is trying to remove those excuses to say, look, true faith is going to evidence itself by action. Now let's get into 1 Timothy 3. This is a faithful saying. If a man seeks the office of an overseer, he desires a good work. 
The overseer, therefore, must be without reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, sensible, modest, hospitable, good at teaching, not a, a drinker, not violent, not greedy for money, not but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetousness, one who rules his own house well, having children in subjection with all reverence. But if a man doesn't know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the assembly of God? A new convert, lest being puffed up, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony from those who are outside to avoid falling into reproach and the snare of the devil. So remember, Paul's dealing with practical concerns here. How is someone going to run the church? People that lead the church. Is it just simply off of knowledge? Is it off their faith? And he's saying, ultimately, there needs to be real pragmatic things that are looked at in a church leader. Uh, he can't be a drinker or a drunkard would be the proper term here. Uh, I think it's given to wine, so he can't have himself given over to these indulgences. Um, he has to be above reproach. He can't be with the husband of one wife. I, I would take that to mean he can't be a polygamist, which in this society uh, there, there may have been and, and there, there were. And a lot of times converts would come into the faith, but he's saying that, uh, and a lot of times the issue is how do I, how do people deal with that, right? Do they divorce their wives and leave them in poverty? No, right? They, they, even though that would not be what God's desire was, that now that they're in this situation, they must care for their wives. However, this is going to keep them from holding an office of elder because they're, if, you, if you have three wives and three families to take care of, you, you don't have time to take care of the church of God. There's not, not going to be any time. So the, there's these things. We can't be we gentle, quarrelsome, not greedy. There has to be these certain attributes um, less elders and deacons be led into temptation and he's this is a list for elders but there's a very similar list for deacons as well also he can't be a new convert because uh, this could lead him to be puffed up and seek wrong reasons so there's a lot of wisdom here in this list um, servants in the same way must be reverent not double tongue not addicted to much wine and servants there is the the, the word for deacon <clears throat> they're literally servants of the church uh, not greedy for money, holding to the mystery of a faith and pure conscience. Let them also first be tested, then let them serve if they are blameless. Their wives in the same way must be reverent, not slanderous, temperate, faithful in all things. And let servants be husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. For those who have served well gain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And so we see this in both lists that one has to rule their own household meaning their wife and children, uh, the, the household needs to be in, ruled correctly. They need to be respecting um, the husband and they need to be walking in the Lord. Otherwise, if you have a person that's just leading and their family's not with them, how are they going to... Let me, let me put it this way. If you have a family that's following the Lord, you take that model and you transfer it to the church. Just as my family is rocking and growing in the Lord, this is what the church is going to do. But if a person's wife doesn't listen to him, doesn't respect him, isn't walking in the Lord, and then the children demean him and disrespect him, how is he going to lead the church? People are going to look at that and say his own family doesn't respect him. And so it's ultimately find people that are good at leading spiritually and and, and look at their family as, as evidence and then put them in charge if they're doing a good job. And there's other requirements as well, but put them in charge because obviously uh, – the fruit of their labor is the evidence you need of what they need to leave. So it's not a, a checklist like I believe this or I know this much theology. Those things are important, but in a real pragmatic sense, they're looking at the fruit of those beliefs on the, in this list. Last uh, short verse here as we close out, 1 Peter 5. I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and who will also share in the glory that will be revealed Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, exercising the oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, not for dishonest gain, but willingly, neither as lording it over those entrusted to you, but making yourselves examples to the flock. When the chief shepherd is revealed, you will receive the crown of glory that doesn't fade away. Likewise, you younger ones, be subject to the elder. Yes, all of you clothe yourselves with humility to subject yourselves to one another. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. May that attitude be in us all. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow.